Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to uh, speak today. Uh, I'll try to uh, squeeze uh, at least an hour and a half talk in uh, 30 minutes. Uh, but uh, so let me begin. Uh, you can see this nice uh, label from uh, uh, Pino Grigio from Eco Domani, which means uh, Vite uh, is now, or here is tomorrow. And so I guess this is an appeal for trying to uh, make people think that uh, it should be possible to change things and point of view uh, uh, as the evidence uh, requires. What do they do? Oh. Huh. The, um, I gave a, a at last a cider conference a talk, <coughs> which I was after Don Anderson, and then one of the uh, members of the audience expressed opinion that we have cancelled the other because. Don was talking about uh, tectonics from top down, and I was stressing the bottom up of this part. But actually, uh, and this is what I will be trying to say to, to you today, is that uh, we may have a, a good evidence that uh, actually both may exist on the same scale. And, uh, the reason is that after the many years, uh, we have actually derived uh, family, different research groups, models which agree in certain robust ways. So uh, it's not, well, they use right sets, I mean, correct sets of data to be sensitive to mantle structure at all depth. And, uh, well, you know, they use different theory, different subsets of data, but uh, here is shown the spectrum of uh, three models, not the newest ones, and you can see that uh, there is actually all three models show, uh, let's see, is this pointer or? Uh, show a very significant change in spectrum at about 250 uh, kilometers depth. This is uh, a wave number or uh, a order of spherical harmonic. They are shorter and shorter <coughs> wavelengths. Uh, and this is power in each degree. So, uh, the red is large and uh, deep blue is weak and uh, it's a logarithmic scale. You also can see that all these models have a stronger degree two at the transition zone or in the transition zone on the upper mantle side and that not very much power than just below it. And then eventually uh, we have lower mantle with a very strong degree uh, two and three uh, again in all of these models. Although the details may be different, the overall structure is about the same. So um, that's why we can talk about, uh, well, three really regions inside the Earth. This is the top. 250 or so kilometers, that's this line here. Uh, there is, uh, but it's a gradual change as the slabs accumulate uh, in the, or stagnate in the, uh, in the transition zone, they have this prevailing degree two. And then it's sort of not particularly eventful uh, middle mantle and then very interesting and uh, probably key element in the uh, large scale earth structure, the what we call a abyssal layer zone. 
Uh, eventually, uh, I will present evidence that we essentially have as if two different planets with uh, 200 or so uh, degrees near the top. I will call it a also pl plate tectonic planets. Then there is transition zone, and then you have a superplume planet, which uh, has these large uh, low velocity provinces. Uh, there are a lot of things going, of course, in the top 200 kilometers, and I'll give you an example from uh, Joran Ekstrom, and this is Pacific cross section uh, going from uh, well, Peru is some nearly 18,000 kilometers, half of the Earth. And you can see that above this uh, thick, broken white line, uh, there is not all that much uh, in the terms of heterogeneity. There is some, but background. And what is really surprising is this very high level of uh, SVSH anisotropy. Uh, which makes SV waves very slow here, and it's difficult to uh, imagine that it's not somehow uh, uh, related to uh, a flow uh, in the upper mantle. So uh, once we get to the uh, 650 kilometers of discontinuity, the first three models have a very well-defined difference between transition zone and, uh, say, velocities at 800 kilometers. Most of these models, not all, but uh, except for this one, have a, a smooth parameterization. So if I showed uh, maps on the either for, for example, for well, this model, uh, uh, then it would be continuous. So you have to. Uh, uh, separate the two maps so that uh, they are far apart uh, to uh, resolution of the data to show it. So uh, not all of them are showing strong structure and so this model for example has only weak constraints in the transition zone. The last one doesn't have anything and uh, looks at that depth, but then it picks up, okay, in a lower most mantle. So uh, Foucault has been studying the velocity anomalies in the, uh, at the uh, uh, subduction zones for a very long time. I think the first paper was sometime in early 90s, uh, and then they improved it, added data. And this is an example of how the uh, subduction, subducted material is spreading uh, in the transition zone. This is an interesting place because you essentially have two subduction zones. And uh, uh, well, it's, it's an example, and there are many of those that, that uh, slabs go flat. Uh, this is an example where things get a little bit more complicated. Tonga is a very uh, complex place. And here you actually uh, see that, well, slab as here uh, bottoms uh, at 1,000 kilometers. This is 410, 660, and 1,000. That's sort of hypothetical discontinuity, which uh, Foucault thinks uh, uh, that it exists. But, uh, in some cross sections, you can see, and they are very uh, closely spaced, this, this upper uh, uh, part shown with the black bracket, <coughs> uh, that here flow a sea of divides, and, and so do earthquakes, uh, into one layer which is uh, contained in the uh, transition zone, and the other one stronger is uh, at the depths of 1,000 kilometer. But there are really no significant examples of uh, slabs going straight through to the bottom of the mantle. So in the, oh, 
uh, that's from our uh, 3D global study and uh, we have these things, some of these things go for 20 degrees uh, in and uh, also they depress the uh, 660, 650 uh, boundary. Uh, you can see it, the black line is uh, variable topography. So it, it sort of is consistent with something heavier, colder being on the top of it. Uh, so the lower mantle, this of course is the big thing. Uh, and uh, the, at 2,000 kilometers, you already begin to see this structure of uh, fast velocities around the Pacific and uh, uh, slow velocities uh, under Africa and uh, Pacific. Uh, uh, and it starts even at 1,000 kilometers. You can uh, uh, recognize <coughs> certain uh, so uh, what we wanted to do is to show uh, again the convergence of these models and uh, we found that it's good to rather than try to average models or cross correlate them is to uh, essentially separate them in two uh, groups where uh, they are, uh, the average travel time is either fast or is slow. And uh, uh, so and we used five models and five means that all five models are shown in the dark red and they're all slow and as you can see there are no breaks in it. Uh, and uh, the same is for is fast, even more. You can see that about 70% of Earth's surface is occupied with the dark blue, which, which is fast. Uh, there is a very interesting uh, structure. I don't know, I guess the battery is in. Oh, maybe I'm pressing more. Uh, here was this plus shine, uh, because it's a relatively small anomaly, small in size, and it's totally separated by the uh, uh, dark blue, meaning that all models show. Uh, so it's, it's very interesting for, well, one, what it is. It, uh, it's something that's seen in all the models. And two, that it, with the data, we can resolve an anomaly of this size. And this is an experiment where we build up uh, that voting map, so uh, for L max 2, the degrees 1 and 2, uh, they are nearly identical. And then it's 4, 6, 8, and so forth, up to 18. Uh, but I'm going to show the uh, enlarged part of the first uh, dose for L max 8. You, begin, you see that something begins to show here. It's stronger if you go to tense harmonic and I don't know what happens. It's somehow, it's very strange. Anyway, uh, this is LMAX 12 uh, and uh, after that it doesn't really change uh, and we think that the above LMAX uh, 12 it's mostly noise and um, what it means is that we, with the seismic data now, have a resolution uh, sufficient to resolve features about a uh, thousand kilometer at the apart at the coal mountain boundary. Yeah. Adam, um, so I'm interested in understanding whether that little anomaly is continuous with the rest of that African thing or not. Um, I understand that all of the tomography models see blue between uh -huh. that between that anomaly in the larger one is, but just forgetting about the voting for a minute, is there any reason why all, is it possible that it could be continuous, but all tomography models see it as not like a resolution well, issue? Well, uh, in, like that? in that paper is another, Barbara wants to say something. Yes.
know, the probability for all models uh, voting in the same way uh, is pretty low that, uh, you know, it's, it's possible. I mean, you cannot dig a hole and go to that place to check it out. Uh, I guess you probably could, if people think it's important enough, uh, they could design an experiment to uh, map it in uh, greater detail. But, uh, well, there are two. One, that uh, it appears that we have a fairly high <coughs> resolution. Uh, people thought that some of these degree two and three things were just because that's all we could recover. But it, this essentially illustrates that uh, we can recover uh, relatively smaller uh, uh, features at, at this great depth. And uh, so this allows us to, um, well, either make new experiments or, uh, okay. Uh, in addition to this voting thing, uh, we derived average uh, slow model. These are deviations from prem and the fast models. Because you have much more blue, uh, the uh, fast models are not very fast. Uh, uh, it's about half percent. On the other hand, the uh, slow models are between minus one and minus five percent. Uh, this is so smooth that actually you could make a straight line. And uh, if you change the reference model, uh, then you can, for example, add half percent at the bottom of the mantle and then subtract. It would make uh, the fast models essentially very close to zero and uh, the negative anomalies would be stronger. The other thing that's important here is that at about 2400, maybe 23, uh, there is sort of fairly abrupt change in a gradient of the anomaly. And in our speculations, we think that this may indicate that that region is, has a uh, certification uh, of uh, chemical, chemical, that essentially chemistry varies with the distance from the core mantle boundary. And above five or 600 kilometers, then it's sort of, it's mostly thermal anomaly and uh, is, uh, a little different from the ambient mantle. So uh, do these uh, features continue uh, into the, uh, uh, away from the core mantle boundary? And this is the same type of voting, but the uh, only uh, models between eight and 1800, so pretty far from to boundary, and essentially what you see is that the basic structure remains the same. You still have African anomaly and you still have a Pacific anomaly, and uh, in particular, I guess here, all the hotspots, including Hawaii, are now uh, in the place where all models agree uh, that they are slow. Uh, so it's not, uh, at least we think that. Uh, the, the structures continue, uh, uh, perhaps to the transition zone. Um, okay, so this is spatial element, and we have seen the variation of uh, distribution of uh, heterogeneity according to its wavelengths at, uh, at uh, 650 or above 650. We have this large degree two, and then we have these large degrees two and three. So that's a spatial resolution. The seismology by itself cannot uh, tell you how, uh, uh, how old the structure is beyond 40 or 50 years. We don't have any data that were accurate enough to say something about heterogeneity. So we went to uh, other source and essentially geodynamic observations, in particular uh, the integrated subduction 
uh, for 0 to 120 years. And what uh, Richards and Ergobertson have shown that uh, geoid, well, it's an integrated thing uh, across the mantle. The hotspots also a surface phenomenon, at least uh, we see them as a surface. Uh, and subduction is also integrated because you uh, infer how much material was subducted uh, from evidence gathered from uh, observations of the surface, except for you know, deep earthquake, but that's only a few uh, tens of years. Uh, but the only one that actually gets to the structure at 2,800 kilometers uh, is the seismic structure. And this very good resemblance uh, is, is really striking, but uh, uh, there was no explanation for it. Uh, then uh, people started uh, associating, um, hmm. okay, I guess I will come back to this slide later. Uh, uh, oh, I guess it was mixed up. Okay, so uh, what we are going to do is we are going to look at, um, well, here is, uh, get confused with, so this is the model of uh, Richards and Ergebritsen. These are uh, slab subduction, subducted material where they converted time uh, into depth. And what you can see is, this is some for the upper mantle. Uh, this, this is uh, retrieving things uh, with a different starting point. But what you can see is that uh, for example, uh, in the last 20 or so, maybe a little bit longer, uh, most of the subduction, look at the first column, was uh, in east-west direction. So you have the large accumulation of uh, material here in the Western Pacific and to some extent under uh, South America and uh, South Atlantic. Then sort of intermediate, uh, a lot of subduction in all kinds of places, but then uh, about 100 million years ago, you had subduction that was mostly in a uh, north-south direction. Uh, here is the, in color map, sum of all the weight of the material per, I guess, uh, whatever, square kilometer. And the point is that uh, uh, this is not like any particular uh, depth range in terms of the subduction. So this is the sum. Uh, and, uh, oh, okay, I have to go back. But this uh, thing was where uh, uh, subducted slabs were supposed to explain uh, seismic anomalies really doesn't work because if you look here at about 2,500 kilometer depth, this is subduction, but this is the uh, seismic model. Huh? They are not very similar except that, well, maybe in this place, so it probably contributed. Uh, spectra are very different. This is degree two and this is degree three. Uh, the spectrum of the slab model is pretty flat, which uh, Alan mentioned in his talk. So we are going to test the idea that uh, the, you, you have to accumulate slabs or have a long-term observation. So uh, this is uh, the sum for, uh, well, in the upper mantle, which sort of uh, covers about uh, 15 or so million years. And uh, this is the total of 110 million years. And we know uh, that slabs are uh, in the upper mantle. So this, this is a uh, velocity model at 600 kilometers. This is the sum of subducted slabs, and uh, 
if you put it through degree two filter, you get essentially things that look identical. 99.9, which is uh, not really, we are not that precise, but it so happens. So in a lower mantle, uh, this is the seismic velocities. These are the some slabs. But if you put it through degree two and also three filter, you have things that look very similar. Uh, with degree three being a little bit uh, having higher power in uh, the slab spectrum. And it's interesting because these three high velocity regions show up in uh, both maps and you know, they really don't have any. And what, after you remove degree two and three, uh, in case of seismic velocities, you have a, something that looks very random and uh, distributed amplitude, but you essentially did not change the shape of the, uh, uh, of the summed slabs. So uh, somehow once the slabs get to uh, 650, we don't see very uh, convincing structures associated. Uh, some of these um, uh, slabs going uh, straight to four mantle boundary really uh, is an exaggeration. So again, the degree two is very special because it's the only one that contributes to the moment of inertia. And this is three models, the Harvard, Berkeley, and uh, Michigan model was done at Cal when Ritzema was at Caltech. And they all have the axis of symmetry in the uh, uh, equatorial plane, and then they have this band of higher velocities, uh, essentially polar band. And uh, this, if you associate uh, uh, red anomalies, for example, with geoid highs, uh, then you have a situation where uh, very good from the standpoint of uh, the mechanics, physics of the problem is that Earth rotates uh, about the maximum moment of inertia, uh, uh, which it should, but the other axis uh, is, uh, it doesn't change actually, it's, it's a spiral circle. And in a situation like this, the uh, uh, pole in a true polar wonder would tend to uh, travel in that direction. Here we compare it with uh, true polar wonder uh, results of Bess and Crutillo from 2002. And people still work, and it essentially works pretty good for 200 million years. The interesting thing is that Theoreticians actually can, uh, so this is 83 or 30 years ago. Uh, in 77, we published our first model, very, very coarse, of uh, heterogeneity and pointed out that there is large structure at uh, uh, the bottom of the mantle. Uh, and uh, uh, Busse, use this to propose that there is a degree two quadrupole convection and uh, so that these red things are associated with upwelling and the deep blue, blue trough with uh, downwelling. And uh, of course it's uh, interesting that then eventually it turns out that uh, that this is a place where slabs want to sink, which is at the uh, minimum uh, geoid height at these degrees. Um, let me uh, jump over that slide. So uh, uh, what we do is we take uh, well, not that much maps. Uh, we are taking uh, 
platelets which uh, uh, Carolina and Mark used. And the ones at the shallowest layer are white, so these are most recent. Uh, the darker colors which go up to black are uh, about hundreds or so million years old. And you can see that with some exceptions, this, this is sort of a difficult place and very complicated, uh, essentially, the slabs for the last uh, <coughs> 100 million years uh, tended to sink more or less in the middle of this trough of high velocities. On the other hand, if we map uh, weighted by volume uh, hotspots, uh, they prefer to sit in the middle of the red structure. So, uh, in some way, it appears that the subduction and uh, hotspots are complementary. There is, one can play games though, uh, because a 3D model is the sum of the uh, reference model, 1D reference model, and then 3D perturbation. Usually we plot things in such a way as on the previous ones, previous slide, oh, Oh, I guess I'm. Uh, that the average at particular depths, this is 2,800 kilometers, is zero. But it doesn't have to be so, because you can add a constant value, for example, to uh, velocities, you would add uh, prem plus half percent of shear velocity anomaly, and you add this and then you plot it. Here is the white is uh, essentially zero or close to zero anomaly. And you can see that now the only very anomalous place is where there are hot spots and that uh, this white ring now, not deep blue, uh, essentially uh, is not, is average. So, uh, obviously, this is an exercise you could do it the other way, other than the uh, slow anomalies are uh, very slow and it would really look very, very strange. But this last picture behind me, I guess, is uh, sort of seems to agree with. Uh, the picture, which this is the whole mantle, and it's a minus 0.6% isosurface, uh, only uh, slow anomalies are shown. And you can see this is map at the bottom, looking from the core up. Uh, you can see that this column, uh, which is the African anomaly, is stretching all the way uh, into the, well, the boundary. Uh, they are really not that connected uh, anomalies in the upper mantle with. And here you have the Pacific anomaly, which again, so at one time named them pillars of the earth, and uh, again, uh, you know, this will all be people who will not agree with it, but. Um, but it's possibility that. Uh, uh, we have essentially two planets, and I, uh, since I probably already talked long enough, I'm not going to explain what the larger principal component analysis is, but you essentially try to, you have 3D model, and try to decompose it in terms of a series of eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, that are associated with them. So uh, the important thing is the variation in depth. So the largest eigenvalue, which represents something over 50% of the whole uh, power in lateral heterogeneities, is very much concentrated uh, just in the top 250 kilometers. And then it's pretty low. The next one is essentially the one that uh, is large at the bottom of the mantle and then in transition zone. 
so uh, they have to be orthogonal, but they really uh, seem to, you know, one is <coughs> confined to just uh, one sort of depth, and the other is uh, uh, in deep inside the earth. So the principal component one, uh, and here we compare it with the full model from which uh, these were derived. You can see that pretty much everything, even in small details, that uh, we see in our uh, model of the heterosphere is explained just by this one uh, eigenvector and, uh, and is very different from everything else in the air. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, reproduce reasonably well the uh, slow uh, anomalies at the uh, bottom and not completely at the other ones like for example transition zone. Uh, but uh, this, so these ter first two eigenvalues uh, reduce the variance uh, in the model by 68% and by the time you get to 6 you reduce it to uh, 95%. So you pretty much explained everything. So um, we have the, these two planets connected uh, with each other in this interplanetary interaction zone and uh, the, um, the First, the plate tectonic planet look like plate tectonics. You have all the ridges, you have cratons. After that, there is really not very much uh, uh, relation to the surface. So, uh, and then it's interaction zone. We, for example, see the accumulated slabs in the uh, bottom of the transi transition zone. Higher up, it's uh, difficult to model uh, uh, anomalies uh, when there is an order of magnitude decrease in the power. So all errors approximations that you make in this very strong thing is. Uh, but then super plume planet uh, has uh, different lengths of anomalies and by using the uh, history of subduction for the last 100 or 200 million years uh, it has a very distinct character. Uh, however, uh, they are connected again because the slabs in the plate tectonics planet, which has only about, on average, 30 million years, uh, the subduction can be quite rearranged during such period of time. And we know that for the last 200 million years, uh, these uh, slow, anomalies, uh, judging from the hotspot tracks and other considerations uh, have been pretty steady. So we have uh, uh, relatively uh, rapidly uh, changing tectonics at the top, but we have a, uh, a very stable uh, structure at the bottom and as the mm, just go a couple of figures. This. Okay, well, I'm finished okay. just about. Uh, uh, so that the, the uh, uh, it seems that this uh, long period uh, or the large wavelengths anomaly actually uh, somehow helps uh, uh, plates to come and sink at this anomaly, which is uh, the large wavelength field is at 2,800 kilometers. Uh, so uh, that's essentially, uh, so what comes from this is that was the fact that the models, at least at large wavelengths, are converging, that uh, there are certain issues that have to be addressed, I guess, but uh, among them is the uh, effect of you know, what happens at 200 or 250 kilometers 
uh, some people like it to be the uh, this very low viscosity zone where uh, the lithosphere can slide over or the mantle convection can slide under the lithosphere. Uh, we have the, uh, the slabs at 650 and then this very large uh, signal at 2900 which seems to explain by averaging in time the uh, subduction during the last 100 million years. Thank you.